Howl's Moving Castle. I didn't think I'd talk about this film, but let's get on with it. So, the reference books. The most famous one is Alberta Robita's, The 20th Century. Hayao Miyazaki had always said that he wanted to make a film adaptation of this book. He's a Paris-based painter in the 19th century, or more like an illustrator or a novelist. He predicted the 20th century in a very humorous way. And the other book is a bit easier to read. It's called Future Days by Isaac Asimov, and the foreword is by Shotaro Ishinomori. I recommend these two books to those of you who are interested in films like Howl's Moving Castle or the works made during the Raputa Castle in the Skies era. Other than that, of course, basically we have Ghibli's textbook series published by Buge Shunju. Two or three days before, Ghibli's textbook, The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, was released. In it, Ghibli producer Toshio Suzuki wrote endlessly about why he never wanted to work with Isao Takahata ever again, and it's the best part. I don't know if this will help you understand the Kaguya story, but I was impressed with how a person could be so brutally attacked after death. This series is a must read. And the original novel, Howl's Moving Castle, written by Diana Wynne Jones. Compared to the original, no, compared to the anime version, the original novel depicts Howe's inner clumsiness more accurately. And the Roman album of the magazine Animeju. They're always interesting to read, but the one about Howe's moving castle had too many drawings and few interviews, so I wasn't quite happy with it. But you can't miss this because... Originally, Ghibli was owned by Tokuma Shoten. And albums or magazine books published by Tokuma go through severe checking. I personally think if the publications of Ghibli were the number one source, the publications of Tokuma should be the number 1.5 source. So, the terms I use here are mostly based on the Roman album published by Tokuma. And lastly, this is a storyboard of the Howl's Moving Castle. You've just got to buy this. You'll notice a lot more details by looking at it. And that makes a huge difference. So, if you're not satisfied with the Miyazaki film, you should look at the storyboard. Today, we'll look at the storyboard and talk about the film step by step. Originally, Hosoda was assigned to direct Howl's Moving Castle as his debut film. You can still see some of his drawings. It was drawn for Ghibli's film, Howl's Moving Castle, and it is labeled Part A. And it's about two-thirds of the whole thing. Hosoda claims that he was sacked. While Miyazaki says the crew ran away. That they broke up. Whereas Suzuki never gave a clear answer. So it remains unclear. I was interested in Hosoda's version, so I expanded the storyboard to see how he did it. And when you look at it, it's set in the modern world. You can see a modern car parked in front of Sophie's shop. And Sophie wears glasses. She wears glasses while working, and she's struggling to find her own path. 
And it's not bad at all. It might have been more interesting to set it in the modern world. Because this piece, uh, I describe this piece as Ghibli's first mop up picture film. Because it was unpopular in Europe. In France, an art exhibition featuring Spirited Away was so popular that people flooded in, and Ghibli advertised Howl's Moving Castle during that time. However, compared to The Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle was unpopular. Well, slightly unpopular. The reason for that is because it wasn't a story about Japan. Europeans wanted to see the modern Japan through Hayao Miyazaki's lens. They felt let down by an imitation of Western culture. Miyazaki was very disappointed by this response. Since Hosoda's version was set in the modern world, maybe things would have been different if they had adopted his version. Even Miyazaki wasn't sure whether he should take it to Europe. For instance, he didn't know what to do in the first scene where Sophie goes to town. In Europe, in the 19th and early 20th century, women never moved their arms or shoulders. So he made her walk with her upper body still. But that made her look a bit cold. So he decided to make her walk like modern Japanese people with both of her arms loose. But eventually, some people actually complain to Miyazaki's chagrin. I wish Ghibli published the whole storyboard of Hosoda's version, but Ghibli's so strict about disclosing this information. Next opportunity will be when Miyazaki dies, and the last opportunity will be when the producer Suzuki dies. Oh, we don't have time for all this. Miyazaki's version of Howl. Well, it's more like the finalized version of Howl. When I saw it for the first time, I mean, this is the impression I got when I saw it the other day. But Howl is basically Miyazaki's alter ego. He's like, I'm wild, on the surface. But Miyazaki is vulnerable inside, and the scary witch, Madame Suleiman, is Takahata. Takahata who treats people like things. Whereas Sophie is like Miyazaki's wife. People say that the reason why Miyazaki goes home, no matter how busy he is, is because his wife is waiting for him at home. Well, that's what I think. First, I must talk about... He's a devoted husband? Ah, oh, well, if you hear my lecture to the end, you'll understand what I mean. He's not a devoted husband in the ordinary sense, but it is obvious that he is a devoted husband in his own unique way. This Howl's Moving Castle had mixed reviews, almost for the first time in Ghibli history. Some people were moved, but some people complained. At this point of his career, Miyazaki began to believe that animation was for kids, and it should be fun and filled with hope. This was something he believed firmly. But, at the same time, he wanted to make a film that was bittersweet and allowed adults to reflect on their lives. So, he created a story with two layers. Kids see it as a fun story with a happy ending, while the adults see it as a bittersweet story that touches their hearts. You can see this double structure in Miyazaki's latter films. His early films like Naushika of the Valley of the Wind or Princess Mononoke had two characters with different views confront each other. It's like the idea of communist revolution that Takahata loves. Miyazaki adopted thesis, antithesis, synthesis into his story. So, Princess Mononoke is a story about a conflict between 
the world of Mononoke and the human world and shows the impossibility of their coexistence. Just around the time he made Spirited Away, the double structure emerged. When there's a conflict, it is difficult to end the story with a happy ending. So technically, it was really difficult for Miyazaki to accomplish that. He made it look like a happy ending by having her parents come back at the end. But at the same time, he makes us wonder why Chihiro came back from the world of the dead. So it has a double structure. But in his last film, The Wind Rises, he dumps everything he did in the past and squeezes in everything he has to say. So he entered a wild phase, so to speak, which I kind of like. But Howl's Moving Castle has a double structure. The upper layer is completely for women, a romantic love story. So it satisfies all the ladies looking for a love story. And in the end, Sophie gets her dream house. So it's a complete happy ending. But for some people, this happy ending doesn't make any sense. Some people say that it's too good. So, like I said, the upper layer, it seems like a typical romantic love story for girls. But if you look at the deeper layer, it's a story about a middle-aged man on the verge of old age. So he denies all hopes and romanticism of men. He lays out his own hypothesis and it's quite interesting. Maybe the word upper layer wasn't right. Maybe it's more like the left layer or the right. The romance in this story is hard to understand. So it makes sense to people who are more familiar with love stories. They're able to enjoy it and say, yes, that is so true. But those who aren't used to these kinds of stories get confused and say, I don't understand these people. At the same time, you need to understand the bittersweet aspect of this story. Otherwise, you'll be bored. It is quite interesting if you understand both sides of the story. So today I will explain it to you thoroughly. Of course, it's also interesting to see it as a pure love story and see Miyazaki's girly side. So I'd like to break it down because it's hard for us men to understand because we're not as feminine as Miyazaki. Many male viewers think that the story isn't interesting enough, or they say that the line at the ending, I am a prince from the neighboring country, is such a cliché. As a matter of fact, Miyazaki's Howl's Moving Castle is so meticulously designed that it's like perfectly made Lego. It's anything but a cliche. It might be hard to believe, but every single detail in this film is meticulously calculated. That nothing happens by coincidence. The reason why it's so hard to grasp is because we see the whole film from Sophie's point of view. For example, what would happen if you see the castle of Cogliostro from Clarice's point of view? Take a look at this. Cogliostro is a simple story, but what happens if you see it from Clarice's point of view? First, she leaves the convent, and she's forced to marry a dirty man. So she runs away in a car. She causes a car accident and is locked into a tower. A thief tries to rescue her, but he's caught in a trap. As she cries, her home teacher Fujiko breaks a window. 
The thief comes and rescues her again, but he is threatened with death, so she decides to surrender and marry the dirty old fellow. She's forced to take a pill and loses consciousness. When she wakes up, she's wearing a wedding dress and the thief gets killed right in front of her. She screams, but he is actually alive. She runs away with the thief, but gets caught again. The thief is threatened with death again, so she dives into the lake to save him. At dawn, Interpol comes. The thief is horrified and runs away. She begs him to take her with him, but the answer is no. She realizes that she is in love. So when you look at it from Clarice's point of view, it's all very messy. This is Clarice's point of view, but you can see how difficult it is to see a film from a certain perspective. You can't narrow it down to a single perspective. Um, it's hard to understand. So, Howl's Moving Castle is told from Sophie's point of view. So, you've got to pick up all the information that is coming at you. For example, uh, this is a bad example. Well, maybe it's not fair to say that, but you know the latest Evangelion 3.0 you cannot redo? The reason why it seems so complex is because it's depicted solely from Shinji Ikari's point of view. If they had written the story from several perspectives, the story would have been a lot easier to understand. When you narrow it down to a single perspective, it becomes extremely subjective and deep like some kind of literature. But in a case like this where you have only one narrator, once you stumble at any point, you're doomed. On top of this complexity, they hired the idol Takuya Kimura to voice act, which created more controversy. Like I said, Howl's Moving Castle is like the mop-up picture, but it was the second biggest hit in Ghibli history. Spirited Away is the first by a huge distance, but Howl comes in second. Suzuki would probably be furious at the term a mop-up picture, but Ghibli was having great success with The Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, and was doing very well setting new records one after another. But for the first time, they stumbled, and this is a failure Suzuki doesn't want to admit. When Miyazaki announced his retirement, he was asked, what is your favorite work? And he immediately answered, I wouldn't say that it's my favorite, but Howl's Moving Castle is like a thorn that has stuck in me for years. So he's constantly bothered by this film. Many people misunderstand, but... Miyazaki tends to fight back when he's told that his story is a cliché or illogical. He says, some people say that my work is illogical or clichéd, but all films are clichéd and films needn't be logical. Well, this is more like the nonsense of a stubborn old man. Because Howl's Moving Castle is logical to the extreme. It blew me away when I did the analysis myself. It is logical inside and out. So, he meant to say, those of you who can't even see the logical side of it and complain that it's a complete failure have no right to see any films. He's like a sulky kid, so you shouldn't take his words too seriously. I wanted to talk about this film because it's actually a boy's film. Or you could say it's a film for middle-aged men and many people don't get that. I liken this to the last scene of the Castle of Cagliostro, where Clarice says, take me with you, I'll learn how to be a thief. This film depicts what would have happened if Lupin had taken her with him. At the same time, it's also like Puella Magi Madoka Magica. 
if you watch the last scene of the TV version. From a different perspective, it's almost like Hal's Moving Castle. I want you to know that Miyazaki actually did something quite amazing.